Hello, and welcome back to the Rising Star Podcast, brought to you by BlackMint.io. I'm Sharika McEwen. And I am Rami Ayodeji. And we're your hosts for today. So as you all know, this show is for students and recent graduates looking to be inspired by professionals who look just like you, making it big in the tech industry. We want to inspire all of you guys to pursue a career in technology so that together, we can create a more diverse and inclusive tech industry. Because after all, diverse teams build better products. And as always, we've got the blueprint for you right here. So today, we've got an exciting guest um, by the name of Tomi Adegute. Toby is a data scientist at Shopify. He recently graduated in 2020 with a degree in computer science and a minor, minor in economics from Ryerson University. He also enjoys the sciences, playing guitar, exercising, playing video games, and generally learning about and exploring technology in his spare time. All right, so let's get into it. Tommy, thanks for joining us. Really happy to have you here. Hi. Hi, Tommy. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. How's going? Awesome. Uh, so far, so good. Can't complain. Awesome. How are you guys? Awesome. Better than can be. <laughs> yeah, doing awesome. Doing really well. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for asking. So, uh, Tommy, we're going to spend some time getting to know you and asking you a little que- asking you a little bit of questions so that our lovely audience can understand what it's like being a data scientist, but more importantly, what it's like being a recent grad. So, to start off, we're going to ask you to t- and our listeners to tell us about yourself. So, we want to know more about your upbringing, your early life, right up until you started post-secondary. Let's start there. Uh, okay, so... I guess I'll start. Um, I was born in Nigeria. Um, my parents are immigrants, so we came here in 1999, 2000 to Canada. Um, and I have vague memories of that, but obviously it was a big adjustment. Um, and then from there, like I kind of just saw my parents just work as hard as they could to to provide for us and to kind of continue to improve our standard of living. Um, you know, you start at an apartment, then you move to a bigger apartment. Oh yeah. Um, and then you move to a house in the suburbs. Um, so you start to kind of integrate and you start to uh, get used to living in Canada and just you gain your citizenship and you become Canadian. And uh, from there, uh, I'd say it was kind of standard. Um, personally, I have sickle cell anemia. So that was always kind of a struggle for me growing up and being in high school and everything. Um, I'd say things in high school early where you start to start like thinking about yourself, what are you going to do? Um, mm-hmm. They start talking about university careers and you kind of have this vague idea of stuff I could do, but you never really know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always interested in technology. We had computers at home um, that I was always kind of constantly on. Uh, I would really loved playing video games when I was a kid. Um, and that kind of was my first like steps into computer science. Um, when I was in elementary school, there was this like flyer for this day camp. It was called iCamp. And I just read like, oh, learn how to make video games. And then from there I was like hooked. I'm like, you can make video games. <laughs> After that it was history. <laughs> and, yeah, pretty much. Uh, so I, I got to attend that day camp. Um, and there's this thing called Game Maker, which is like a visual programming language. Mm -hmm. Um, and like it was ifs, loops, uh, conditional statements, all that. And Mm -hmm. at the time I had no idea I was learning programming. Um, I was just learning it and I just wanted to make games and use it to make games. And then, uh, I got to go to that day camp once or twice more. Um, and in my mind that was just game making. Um, so for the next few years I said, uh, I want to be a game maker. I want to make video games for a living. Um, And that kind of continued to high school where it seemed like people weren't taking me seriously when I'd say that. So I guess I kind of got shy about it and stopped saying it. And I was lost for a little bit. And then funny enough, Io came to to stay at our house. Um, Yep, (laughs) that happened. (laughs) And and he was actually uh, at Windsor University at the time. um, And he was interning for Blackberry. And I just (laughs) thought, it was, it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, he had this Blackberry that wasn't released. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you could have jobs in tech like this. 
Um, and I, I still didn't really know what computer science was. I'd kind of fallen off of like making games and whatever. Um, so then it wasn't until like grade 11-ish where I took a CS class because my friends were like, oh, we play video games in class. This is, this is a great class. The teacher is like, whatever. Uh, and then I went there and we started learning C sharp. And then I was like, wait, I recognize all this stuff. Um, like it was the loops, it was the conditionals. I was like, I've done this before. Um, so I started to take it to it really quickly. Um, and nice. uh, obviously every time I play video games from when I stopped in elementary school to high school, in my mind, I was always thinking about how they made these games. And I was always really interested in those kind of videos and things. Mm -hmm. um, but then unfortunately in grade 12, um, I didn't really do too well. I was kind of sick. I had issues with my sickle cell. Uh, so mm -hmm. I couldn't actually, uh, when I applied to computer science, I needed calculus and I unfortunately couldn't get that mark before I graduated. So I took an extra semester of school and I ended up going into university uh, for international economics and finance. Um, and that's where I started at Ryerson. Um, but then after a while, uh, I started feeling like not quite, I couldn't really see myself doing this long term, mm -hmm. um, being an ec economist and everything. Um, and then funny enough, there was one day like in my second year, I hadn't really been going to class and I was like scrambling, studying for a test, whatever. I was listening to some music like to try to like focus. And for whatever reason, they had spliced in part of Steve Jobs' Stanford address. And I didn't know wow. it at the time. So okay. all of a sudden I hear this voice come on. It's like, oh, your work is gonna fill up a large part of your life. Um, and the only way to do to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Yeah, and that just kind of really. hit me pretty hard, especially as I'm like, do I want to do this? Absolutely. And all of a sudden, I, I kind of looked up at what I was studying, like this test I was scrubbing. I had like two tabs for the test I was studying for, and then like a million tabs for like Python, learn Python, all this stuff. So I'm like, okay, so this isn't working anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then from there, I just started taking computer science classes. Uh, I went to night school to uh, pick up the calculus mark I needed. Um, and then I applied to switch to computer science at Ryerson again. Um, and I guess third time was a charm because I got in that time. Awesome. And then from there, um, awesome. my grades kind of shot up and I felt like I was, I was where I was supposed to be. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, I really love like the way the teachers made it interesting for you like the summer camp and mm -hmm. um the your computer science teacher like they would have made it fun right like your computer science actually let students play games like he let them play video games in class which is like obviously that's how you get the guys right i mean that's how you get <laughs> the students i guess <laughs> girls too you know like like we're gonna be having fun in class but why wouldn't i take that class so um if there's any teachers listening here this is basically how you get the kids <laughs> Yeah, you hook them, tell them to get to play games. <laughs> but yeah, that's really, really good. I'm really happy to hear that story. Um, yeah. What about you, Shrika? What do you think? Well, surprisingly, uh, Tommy, uh, I also uh, pursued international economics and finance at Ryerson in my first year. Uh, I felt the same way about you in terms of, you know, do I really want to be an economist? Like, it's so broad. Like, I can't really specialize in something. Yeah. Uh, and so in my second year, I actually switched into FCAD uh, and then ended up doing media production and specializing in media business. So I love that story that you had there. I think I also had a moment of realization. And this is just for everyone who's listening today. If you find that the first degree choice that you're doing in university is not working out for you, you can talk to your program advisors to figure out how you can make that pivot or switch into the degree that the degree in which you want. So I actually loved hearing that, and I love that you, you know, persevered and, and did did night school, and to to get that calculus mark. So like, bravo, honestly. Yeah, like uh, to your point, Sharika. Like it's it's never a straight line. Um, Absolutely. People have tons of interests, and I think that being able to kind of adapt and say that maybe this isn't working, maybe I could be happier in a different situation, is something that's important, and not just to kind to keep pushing yourself through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know it Definitely. may be hard at first uh, because, you know, your parents want you to go to school. They have these expectations for you. Um, but if you just really take time to reflect and, and really plan out, you know, what you want to do, it'll work out for you. So I, 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 so. I, loved, I love that you shared that, honestly. <laughs> yeah. 
So now you're in computer science at Ryerson University, and in, you know you graduated in 2020. Out of curiosity, have you had any co-op experience of, of any sort? Uh, and if yeah. So, what was so, it like? So I'd say uh, that experience, especially in a in an area like computer science, is super important. Um, I'd say it's where I got most of my like skills and experience. Although school um, and the classes I took gave me this kind of broad knowledge base of CS that allows me to be really flexible and adaptable. Mm -hmm. um, the the kind of co-op experience and hands-on practical things are where I feel like I built most of my skill set um, that I still use today. Uh, I started out as a research assistant um, at a work study position at school. So I'd say for anyone in university right now who's looking to kind of gain their put get their foot in the door, um, work study is amazing. They're really flexible with you because they understand you're a student, you have school, um, and since they're part of the university too, um, it's very it's very easy for them to understand. Um, so I applied for this work study position that was data analytics. I had zero clue what I was getting myself into. Uh, I really thought I'd be staring at like a wall in a professor's like uh, office for an entire summer, and I was okay with that because I get some experience. Um, I actually ended up walking into uh, this office that was part of Ryerson's DMZ, their digital media zone, where they have a lot of startups. Um, specifically, they're in the legal innovation zone where they have a lot of legal startups. Um, and the lab I was walking into um, actually had a Canadian research chair as its head. <laughs> Um, it was a social media lab kind of doing uh, research across the entire social media spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. So I ended up walking into that and getting a lot of really valuable experience. Um, and they were they were really good to me. So after that initial summer, I did full time. Um, they let me continue part time during the semester. Um, and I was doing all sorts of stuff. That's where I started like learning how to maintain servers, um, pull data, analyze data. Um, and it was a really valuable experience for me. Um, and then they were nice enough the next summer to allow me to do a internship at another company um, and still hire me back during the semester. So that's awesome. They were, they were super nice to me. Um, so I did that second internship um, at a place called Publicis Sapient and they're like a consulting firm. Um, so there I was subcontracted to Lobla Digital, um, which is, the digital branch of Loblaws Inc., the, the grocery store. Um, mm -hmm. And they're doing a lot of really interesting work there too. Um, and then there's a few intern uh, projects that I kind of made sure were data related. So uh, uh, I was able to gain a lot of valuable experience there. But uh, I'd say go for work study because uh, you never know what opportunities you'll find there. Um, and they end up being really flexible and adaptable. Um, even referring some friends to to look into work study, uh, they found a lot of success and experience out of it too. Um, and then obviously that helps you kind of get the next co-op because they see you already have work experience. Um, That's awesome. And, and after I graduated, my last one was an internship at Shopify as a data scientist. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. What was that like? So basically you were working um, for Ryerson University through DMZ and then um, all of a sudden, you were a data science intern at Shopify. How did you land that role? And what was Ooh. that um, internship like? So first, uh, one of the friends I actually made during that second internship uh, at Publicis Sapient, um, he went on to go work at Shopify as an intern. And he's the one who referred me. So we kept a relationship um, after the internship because, I don't know, obviously you make friends. and. You guys talk and you guys are in the same area. You guys do similar work. So it's easy to get along. Wow. Um, so he was at Shopify and I was about to graduate, uh, obviously looking for a job. So I was interested in Shopify um, and they had a data science position. Funny enough, Perfect. and this kind of speaks to, you never know, like it's never a straight path. Uh, I had actually applied for two roles. One was production engineering and one was data science. My data science application actually didn't get picked up and it was the production engineer one that did. So I was interviewing along the entire way thinking I was gonna do production engineering until I got to the end of my interviews where I passed and they're like, okay, so now we wanna put you on a team. 
Um, and I kind of said like one of my favorite moments is when like you have data and you transform it and you like put in a graph and all of a sudden uh, insights become immediately like uh, like obvious. You, obvious. Thank you. Um, and then they're like, okay, so we'll get back to you. I got an email like a day later. Like the data science team wants to talk to you, and that's when I got really <laughs> excited. Um, so then I was able to talk to them. It seems like I said stuff that that made sense to them. So uh, I joined their team. Um, and that's how I ended up as a data scientist at Shopify. Well, that's actually really, really cool. You know, um, I've worked as a data scientist as well, um, but lots of people say, in your opinion, that is my, this is, also, I have this opinion, but um, I'm just wondering what your opinion is. Is it true that as a data scientist, you're always learning, like you're all constantly evolving? Is that true? Uh I'd say it is because um, data science, you have like the skill set of like, oh, you know, Python and, you know, a few like libraries and and things that help facilitate that like data science, like work from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd imagine you also realize that uh, you're dealing with data very specific to a subject area, um, which means you have to start to learn about it, um, pick up things you never thought you'd learn. Uh, working as part of Shopify Fulfillment Network at Shopify, um, like I've had to pick up more than I ever thought I would about logistics. Uh, I work specifically kind of on the acquisition side. So I learn more about marketing, sales, onboarding, uh, logistical processes, inbounding, uh, mm -hmm. inventory, inventory management, <laughs> um, all these things that were kind of outside of my uh, idea of my area of expertise. Uh, mm -hmm. But now I'm kind of flipping it to use my technical skills to facilitate these kind of uh, broader broader analysis and actually drive actionable insights from them. And for that, you need a kind of a lot of context. And then of course, the area of data science is constantly evolving with new technologies and frameworks and uh, methods of analysis. So that's always <laughs> Yeah, that's actually like a really good way um, to, to, to put it. And it's actually interesting. Um, lots of people actually forget about the domain knowledge, the, mm -hmm. the importance of domain knowledge in data science. You know, like you can't, honestly, you cannot do data science because you're trying to use data to improve the business, right? To help the business mm -hmm. in some way. But if you don't understand the business, you don't have the domain knowledge, how are you supposed to know what you're supposed to be improving, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, that's actually really, really cool. and. That's a really good perspective, you know. Like I said, people don't really think about that, but the fact that you're learning in that area, you're learning about logistics, you're learning about you know fulfillment, you're learning about all that stuff. Uh, that just shows how you know the breadth of knowledge that comes with the job. But it's actually really exciting. But then speaking about data science, what exactly is data science, and what is it like being a data scientist at Shopify? Oh, you're asking me what data science means. And honestly, sometimes I'm not sure I know. Um, I'd say a data scientist is someone who, who uses data um, across various systems, combines data from uh, a lot of different sources to drive actionable insights about the business and improve business processes uh, and find optimizations. So yeah. I'd say um, at full stack, at, at Shopify, they like to emphasize the idea of a full stack data scientist. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that I am dealing with everything from the source systems um, to making machine learning models. And they like to use this uh, data science hierarchy of needs, which kind of goes through like instrumentation, um, observation, like analysis, um, all the way up to like the tiny pyramid, which is machine learning, which everyone wants to do in data science, but it's kind of a climb there. Um, but I really like that approach because it gives me a lot of confidence, especially when dealing with stakeholders and people who are kind of in their domain um, to really say, if they point out a data point and they say, I'm not quite sure about this number, um, I can kind of go all the way back to saying that uh, I pulled the data from the, this exact source I ran mm -hmm. this ETL job, which is extract, transform, load, meaning I yeah. did op these operations on the data to transform mm -hmm. it into this stage um, to pull out this insight. And this is the number I'm giving you. And I'm giving mm -hmm. it to you because of uh, these conditions, like this system and this system are misaligned. Um, so I'm compensating for that in X, Y, and Z way and really give that full explanation of um, this is the data point. 
and I believe it's correct because of this reason. Um, and that's really important in trust because um, data science uh, uh, they emphasize is all about trust. Um, can people trust your numbers? Um, and can they, do they believe they can actually drive, uh, make meaningful decisions off of the data you're providing them? And that, that's really important. Um, otherwise, they're making not data informed decisions. And as a data scientist, that kind of gives me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I really, I really like that approach. Um, just like you said, the full stack uh, data scientist approach, because you got to do it from the source right from the beginning. And you understand all the different transformations and processes that got you to that mm -hmm. point before you get to the fun part, which is machine learning. Um, you're actually able to build that trust. Um, and I've actually haven't really thought of it that way. You know, like, using that the fact that you process all that, or you started from from scratch basically you didn't have a data engineer you know do all that processing for you and then you just did the machine learning part you know you actually did the whole thing so actually using that as a tool to build trust um i think that's really really valuable so yeah thanks for sharing that <laughs> oh so, i also do want to give sorry uh a no, big shout on, out to on. our data engineers at shopify actually because as much nice. as i may hype up shopify data scientists uh the data engineers that have given us a really good platform um, right. that's, that's built around and like fully fledged to make it easy for me to do all those ETL and everything else. <laughs> yeah, that's that makes awesome. sense. And so as a follow up question, Tomi, can you tell some of our fabulous listeners, what are some of the skills required to become a data scientist? Um, so I'd say you kind of need to start at, um, do I know how to pull data from different sources? Um, and this is kind of uh like do i understand apis that i need to ping to pull data um like one of one of the projects that i thought and really gave me a lot of confidence was um me and my friend were trying to build like an nba analytics app um so like i found these random nba uh, endpoints and i just started to try to pull data from them and it somehow started to work and i started <laughs> noticing like little little um thing so it's like when you want about the player icons um i i had been looking at the data and studying it so i realized that the uh player id that they used was the same as the one that they use on their site for their pictures so then i wrote a quick script that used the url but replaced the player id and all of a sudden we have like a few thousand players player icons um, oh that's awesome so being, yeah being able to make those connections between data um the endpoints you're using um, is a big part. And that's kind of the start. So it's like, can I, get, can I get the data? The second part is, do I understand how to transform it to make it usable? Um, whether that be things like, uh, so I have a bunch of player data. Um, does that really help me? Because I can't organize them into teams. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so knowing what data points you, knew, use, you need to use to organize those all those players you have, because you only have player data, so now you have them as teams, mm -hmm. and then you kind of go a level higher. So can I move them into Western and Eastern Conference, for example? Um, and there's just a lot of things like that. So that's a lot of skills like Python, uh, which is personally one of my favorite programming languages. Um, there are things like R, people use for data analytics as well. Um, and then start to understand some of the packages you might kind of need to use um, on top of those. So it's like for Python, Pandas is a big one. Um, at work, we use a lot of PySpark. Um, SQL is a back, actually really big skill, um, SQL for data scientists as well, um, to be able to query a, 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 a database, to be able to kind of pull a bunch of different data points together to compile them to give you um, different views. Um, mm -hmm. At work every day, I'm pulling data from a lot of different sources um, mm -hmm. and that go kind of across different systems that are collected in different ways. Um, so I need to understand kind of how can I connect these two data points? What joins can I do? Um, and what aggregates actually make sense? Um, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. That actually makes a lot of sense. So you talked a lot about the tech, some of the technical skills. And you know, this you didn't mention machine learning, which is very interesting. And I think a lot of people need to understand this because, you know. A lot of people think data science is about machine learning, right? But before you get to machine learning, you got to get the data. You got to understand the data, right? So um, that is a really, really important skill. So um, you should definitely cultivate that. So, but you mentioned a lot of technical skills. How about soft skills? 
Oh yeah. The soft skills are, are an area where actually during my internship, um, was where I felt like I was lacking the most. And over the last year or so I've been at Shopify, I felt like I've really built them. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, trust is really important in um, with your stakeholders, the people who are actually like in the steep of it for that specific part of the, of the business. Um, so building trust with them is really important, which means you need to be really good at communicating. Because um, of course, I could go off kind of on tangents and say that oh, we use Python, we transformed SQL, blah, 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 which will, a lot of the stakeholders aren't technical in that same way. So explaining it to them like that will, will get you nowhere. Um, so being able to really uh, meet people at the level of their understanding about the technology. Uh, but then, of course, the, the things you're trying to get out of them are really the business processes and trying to understand the business. So being able to really listen um, understand the point of view of someone else and then be able to offer solutions that they can't, they may not have thought of because they don't understand the data the same way. So um, like later this year, hazmat detection is kind of on our list to say that this product coming in isn't allowed on our network because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but like the, the teams I'm working with may not understand that we can do this kind of crazy machine learning to analyze all these data points and kind of build an automatic classifier. That's something that's not within their understanding, but I need to offer as a solution, but I need to listen to their problem and what they're trying to do to kind of understand that. It's pretty good. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Very nice. And I just love how you were able to tell all of our listeners you know, what it takes and, and what it's actually like being a data scientist, especially since it's so early in your career. So congrats again, Tomi. Thank you. But uh, right now we're going to move into um, a little segment, uh, what we like to call our quick fire question. And so we're just going to ask you a couple of questions and then you're just going to answer uh, whatever comes to your mind first. Okay. Awesome. So the first question we have here is, have you had any mentors in your career journey? If so, what impact have they had on your life? Oh man, I'd say I had a ton. Um, their, their kind of constant presence is, has been kind of a big influence. Obviously in the early days, IO, I'd say was one. He kind of showed me <laughs> a lot of things about technology, um, kind of showed me that this is a career path that people can be really successful in. Um, of course, the people at the social media lab, they're kind of infinite uh, understanding and helping me along. Um, there's obviously people in my life, my friends, my family, uh, my sister, actually, she's, she's in tech too. Uh, she gave me a lot of tips and tricks. Um, and yeah, they're, they've been massive. I couldn't, have, I couldn't be here without them really. I love that. And just for the listeners who are listening on for today, your mentors can be either personal or even professional. They can come from any aspect within your life, depending on, you know, what, what, where, where you are in your journey. So I love that. So our next question is, if you had the chance to speak to your younger self in high school or maybe even middle school, what would you say? Oh, man, uh, there's too much I want to tell them. But I'd <laughs> say, I'd say uh, you're, you're not doing so bad. Um, just keep trying. Um, you'll get there eventually. I love that. That's a really good one. Yeah, that's a really good one. OK, so my question is, what book would you recommend for our fabulous readers uh, honestly, one of the books that had the biggest impact is actually a book called The Power of Habit. Um, and I'd say that because it, it really got me thinking about the things I do every day, um, my bad habits, my good habits, and how to improve and kind of change habits. So I, I realized I made a lot of progress when I started making things habits and habitual. So it's like, um, I used to be really bad at math. <laughs> And that was something that was like an area of focus for improvement for me. So I went on Khan Academy and I just started. And I say, I try to do 25 minutes a day. And on bad days, I try to do one question. And making it habitual made it so it's like, on my bad days, if I did one question, sometimes I do two questions, three questions. And then all of a sudden I found myself at 25 minutes or so. And I kind of made some progress. And then that progress day to day just adds up and it gets you somewhere. That's, that's amazing. So there you have it, guys. So told me, um, who's a data scientist at Shopify, he felt like he wasn't that good at math, but he still landed a job as a data scientist <laughs> at Shopify. <laughs> so even thinking you're not good at math, 
well, guess what? You can still do it and you can actually form that habit and get better at math and be a better data scientist. So don't mm. shoot yourself down because you feel like you're not good at something, blah, blah, blah. That's just your mind tell, giving excuses. Form the right habits, do what you need to do, and you too can be successful, like Tommy. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I mean, that. I went from like failing uh, high school math multiple times in some years. Like I'd fail in grade like 10, 11, and then I'd have to take summer school to like getting 80s, 90s and university math just because I kind of built that habit and kept and kept it up. There you go. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. So one last question. If you had to share one skill or something about yourself, one thing about yourself that you feel has made you successful, what would it be? Um, I think it's just grit, like just the ability to stick with it and keep trying. Um, I remember <laughs> there was something I said to one of my friends in the early days when we were first in like first year computer science, where he's like, some of these like CS problems are hard. And it's like you have a bug in your program. Like, how do you how do you fix it? Like, how do you go about it? And then I said, I looked at him. I'm like, I just bash my head against the wall, and either the wall <laughs> breaks or I break. <laughs> I love that. And then, and then a few years later, um, as we were closer to graduation, he's like, you know what? You said this to me first year, and I had almost forgotten at that point. But he's like, like it's really true. Like, you just sit down and you keep trying to tackle the problem. And eventually, either you give up on the problem or you overcome the problem. And there's kind of those two paths. And so honestly, stay gritty. Yeah, for sure. And honestly, guys, that would be so, so valuable, especially in the area of you know computer science, um, because you know the more you're able to crack those really difficult problems, the more you're able to reinforce the fact that you can do it. Right. Once you do it the first couple of times, you're like, oh, OK, maybe I can do it. And then you keep doing it and then you keep doing it. And it's crazy because at the beginning, it's like this is impossible. Like, how am I supposed yeah. to figure this out? But somehow you always figure it out eventually. Exactly. So, like, the more you keep pushing yourself and the more you keep, you know, being successful and just trying, the more confident you are to tackle even bigger problems. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's so, so valuable. And trust me, guys, there's no better feeling than when your code actually runs the way it's supposed to, like when you finally <laughs> figure it out, there's no better feeling than that. <laughs> that was awesome to me. Wow. So um, how can our listeners uh, reach you or, you know, learn more about your career or follow your career? What would, what, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, well, I have a Twitter that's kind of more professionally geared called OT Adeguate, so OT. A D E G B I T E. Um, and then, of course, you can find me at Tommy Adigwata on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, add me and we can get to talking. Awesome. All right. Awesome. You heard that, guys. Listen to him. I mean, sorry, add, add him. <laughs> <laughs> add him on Twitter and on LinkedIn. <laughs> so, again, thanks for being here with us today, Tommy. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on the Rise Dark podcast. You dropped a lot of gems for our listeners today. And once again, Rising Star Platform, giving you guys a blueprint for today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I uh, had a lot of fun, and I hope your listeners find some value. Oh, definitely. Really happy to have you. See ya. Bye. Thanks. Until next time, guys.